Hello again, Bob Stretch here. Today we're going to be looking at estimating parameters with Excel. Now the first thing we need is Excel's free statistics add-in. You can go ahead and pause the video and follow these steps to make sure you get it done correctly. I cut and pasted them right from Microsoft's Office help pages so you shouldn't have any problems. Once you have that, we can actually get started with playing around with statistics. It's important that we use the correct words when we're discussing population estimates, otherwise we can get messed up pretty quickly. Whenever you hear the word statistic, it's referring back to a measurement from a sample. Now because a sample is only part of a population, then all it can ever be used for is an estimate of what the population may actually have as a value. We normally denote any kind of statistic by using Greek characters. Now unlike a statistic, a parameter comes directly from a population. We actually count every single element in the population. We call that a census. Now, if every element is captured and counted, then there are no errors in terms of the value, and we know exactly what the population's parameter value is. Needless to say, that's very expensive and time-consuming, so we don't do it very often. We indicate population parameters using Roman, or as you would say, English letters. So make sure that you're using the right kind of measurement and discussing it properly as we go through this particular section. Now when we look at parameter estimation, in other words, guessing what the parameter value is, the first thing we have to do is split it into two different categories based on the type of data you're working with. If you have metric or scale data, interval or ratio, then you use the mean estimation method. On the other hand, if you have categorical or nominal ordinal data, you have to use the percent estimation. You cannot confuse these two if you want to get the correct answers. Now we'll work both today, but it's important to realize that they are separate and you have to pay attention to the type of data you're working with. Our goal then is to try to find the box that the actual population parameter more than likely exists in. We're not trying to get the actual parameter value itself. We can't get that. We're only going to estimate where that value may lie within a certain percentage. Okay? So let's take a second to look at this graphically. Again, what we're trying to do is to take something we know, a statistic, that's based on a sample and estimate or guess where the parameter of the population may lie. Again, two different methods, two different flavors, categorical versus the metric. So how do we do this? Well, if I have categorical data, I am basically looking at either or data. Either you went to college or you didn't go to college. Either you're a male or you're a female. Those kind of differentiations. And the way we typically display those is in a pie chart. So what we're looking at is, given the percentage in that pie chart that we know based on our statistic, what's the range that the actual population, if we were able to count everybody, would have in terms of that population percentage. That's why we're measuring percentages. On the other hand, if we're looking at the metric data, scale data, interval ratio, this is where we say on a scale of 1 to 7, or how high are you on inches, or how many pounds do you weigh, something that is a full number line, then what we're looking at instead of a pie chart is in fact a regular curve of data and we're taking a small subset, the sample, and from that sample trying to guess inside a certain range where the population mean might be. So that's where you get the percentage style versus the mean style. It all drives back to the underlying type of data. One last time, we're not trying to find what the parameter actually is, but only where it lies. Trying to get our hands around the general area and that's it. Okay. So let's get started. Let's try the one that's the easiest because Excel does most of the work for us. Let's start with metrics. Now there are five steps to accomplish each of these two techniques. The nice thing is for metric data, if you have the add-in for Excel, it's going to do the first four steps for you in a New York heartbeat and you only have to do one simple step at the end. So yes, we're going to be calculating the average of the value, standard deviation, standard error, multiply the error by the z-value, da 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 and then we're going to add and subtract all the stuff we got in the purple box from the average to get the upper and lower limits for that confidence interval for the box we were looking for where the population parameter most likely will lie. So let's take a look at that with an Excel spreadsheet. If you remember, we had two different variables we were looking at before, EDCAT and lifestyle. And if we look at the key, EDCAT was a categorical variable. In other words, you could pick one or the other, but not both. Either you didn't finish high school or you did. Either you went to some college or you didn't. This type of data gives us 
the percentage as the method we have to use. Unlike Lifestyle 6, where we're saying on a scale of 1 to 7, does this describe you or does this not describe you? That's a number line, that's a range, that is scale data. So there we're going to be looking at means. So let's start off again with means, which means we're going to be using the lifestyle variable. So we simply click in the first cell for the lifestyle variable and then control space to capture all the data. And then we're going to come up here to the data tab, click that, hit the tile that says data analysis. Now if you remember what we were asked to find, it was the average, standard deviation, those are all measures of descriptive statistics. So we're going to go ahead and ask for the descriptive statistics, and it's going to ask us for the input range. Well, we've already selected that, so that is our correct input range. We'd like it by columns. Give us some labels so we know what we're looking at. Go ahead and put it in a new worksheet, a new tab for us, and then just click all of these. We want the summary statistics, and the confidence interval will set at 95. That's fairly standard for most things you're looking at inside marketing and science. Once we have these set up, go ahead and click OK. Surprise, surprise, it's already done, and there's the majority of our data already calculated for us. There's the mean, standard error, standard deviation, and there's our value for the confidence level using that z-score we talked about earlier. So all we really have to do then is try to figure out the lower and upper range for that confidence interval, for the box. So to do the lower, all we have to do equals, to get the equation started, is we take the mean minus the confidence interval. For the upper, equals mean plus confidence level, boom. What this means is somewhere between 4.29 and 4.48, there's a 95% chance that the actual mean of the population, the parameter, is in that yellow box. Now, that also means there's a 5% chance that we blew it entirely. We just had a bad sample for whatever reason. And it is not, in fact, between 4.29 and 4.48. But we don't really know that. We just know there's a really good chance, 95% chance, that that's where it actually lies. That's all it takes. Boom, boom, you're done. You now have an estimate of the population's parameter. So what about then trying to deal with this other type of variable, the educational category? Again, this is categorical data, so we have to handle it differently. Capture the data first. We click on the top box, control space. Now, again, you have to be smarter than the software you're working with. If we go back to data, data analysis, descriptive statistics, and say OK, and look at that. Excel went ahead and dutifully gave us all that same data, everything we ever wanted to see. The problem is, it's all bogus. We can't use it. Remember we talked about trying to use a mean on categorical data, how foolish that was? So this data, although it is calculated perfectly, has no value at all. It's junk. So let's go back to our data and see what we really need to do. Well, if you remember, there were five steps that I said that we need to take. So let's take a look at those. For non-metrics, first we have to get the sample percentage, P, the area we're looking at. Subtract that P from 100% to get the Q value. Then calculate the standard error of the percentage, and you can see the calculation there, the square root of P times Q all over N, and N is the number of instances or observations inside your sample. Then you multiply that value times the Z value. Now these are standard scores. If you want 95% confidence interval, it's 1.96. If you want 99% confidence interval, it's 2.58. We generally go for the 95. That's a reasonable number. You can get to that fairly easily without having to spend a lot of money. If you go to 99%, you also tend to get a wider range to look in because it's got to allow for more variance in the data than it was if it was only 95%. And then as we did with the metrics, we just simply subtract the value we get from our p-value in this case, as opposed to the mean in the other case, to get the upper and lower limits of the confidence interval. So the first thing we want to look at then is the p and the q. In other words, the percentage that a given value appears. In order to do that, we have to come up with a histogram or some other means of actually counting these up. Now, we've already learned how to do this in a very quick and easy way by coming up with pivot charts. So if we do a pivot chart on that data and we click on the variable, drag it down into values, and notice it automatically pops up into count, and there we go. Now we have the various possible p-values. Looking back at our key for EdCat, let's say we were interested in the percent of people in a population who have a college degree or more. If we scroll through this, we see that 1 is less than high school, 2 is high school diploma, 3 is some college, 4 and 5 is a college degree and post-college degree. Hmm, 
Well, that means we can clump this data. So let's go back and look at this. One, two, and three are non-college. So let's just say equal, sum, open parent, non-degree, close parent, and then four and five, college degree or a graduate degree, equals the sum, open parent, these two, close parent. That's our difference. So this would be, if we're interested in the number of people that actually have a degree, this would be our P and this would be our Q. Remember, it has to be one or the other. So this one then is our non-degree, and these folks are degree holders. So then going back to our steps, let's see where we're at. We've gotten the sample percentage, so we finished step one. Now we have to subtract P from 100 to get Q. Well, we have our raw numbers, but now we have to create the percentage and then subtract the P from 100% to get the Q. So let's go ahead and give that a try. In order to get the percentage, I would simply take the part, which in this case is our count, divided by the whole, and we want this expressed in a percentage. I could do the same thing to get our other value, the Q value, or as step two would indicate, just simply equals 100% minus the P value. There you go. Just to make sure we've done our math right, let's sum these two values 100%. So we've captured all the data, and we now know this area we're most concerned with here is the degree, the P value. So let's go back and look at our steps. We've got step one done. We've got step two done. Now we have to calculate the standard error of the percentage. So square root of P times Q over N. Let's go ahead and do that. We have step three accomplished. Step four, multiply that value by 1.96 because we're concerned with 95%, so 1.96. Step five, add and subtract the step four value from the P value to get the limit. So let's take a look. P minus the value in step four, P plus the value in step four. And what we find then is the population parameter should lie somewhere between 60.3% and 66.3% of the population based on the sample that we have. Just remember, we have to use the correct method to fit our style of data. All right, good luck. Go ahead and try these on your own and see what you come up with. Make sure you also pay attention to how the textbook tells you you should report your findings. There are very specific ways to state your results. That was your hint for the day. Have a great one. See you again soon.